<laughs> so, first things first, what makes something Lovecraftian? Well, I would say that it's a combination of many things. Forbidden knowledge that shatters all you know. A sense of being small, unaware, and unimportant in the face of forces far more powerful and ancient than you can understand. A sense of otherness. The disturbance of the status quo. Or a person's world shattered and turned upside down. If I had to boil it down to just a couple words, it would be existential dread. I am constantly on the hunt for great movies that explore Lovecraftian themes. However, they're actually pretty hard to come by. Good ones, I mean. Because Lovecraft's stories and concepts have been adapted numerous times over and mostly very poorly. The reason for this, in my opinion, is that it's very hard to adapt the inconceivable to a visual medium. Lovecraftian themes and stories are massive in scale and depth and capture a sense of dread and the abstractly alien that is easier to imagine when reading than it is to convey on film. Combine that with Lovecraft's tendency to fall back on the old tried and true it's indescribable method of characterizing eldritch horrors, which is just not helpful, that it makes his writing nearly impossible to adapt in a way that is universally recognizable. When you read about Azathoth or Narlothotep or any number of elder gods, your mind fills in all the blanks of what these creatures look like with your own imaginative fears. So when a filmmaker shows you their interpretation, it usually won't match up with everyone's preconceived mental depiction. This is one of the beautiful things about Lovecraft's writing. It's very personalized to your fears. They take on the form of what you bring to them. 2020's Underwater, a more recent example, is great at capturing the size and scale of a tentacled Lovecraftian abomination. This is a movie that's unfortunately very light on substance, but it is a ton of fun purely as a creature feature. However, there is more to Lovecraft's themes than just, look, big squid guy. Then you look at the reanimator films, which beautifully capture Lovecraftian atmospheres and ideals. However, the series isn't exactly true to the source material. Recently, I had the immense honor of meeting Dennis Paoli, one of the writers for reanimator. He was the sweetest guy and he had tons of great stories. And after listening to him for a while, I began to realize just how many alterations to the original story were necessary in order to adapt it to a modern viewing audience. Which makes complete sense. It was a series of short stories written in the early 1920s by a racist xenophobe hiding a bird in his mouth. Stuff needed to be changed. The point I'm trying to make with these examples is that it's incredibly hard to nail a Lovecraft adaptation. And it's not always as easy as adapting the text directly to the screen. Sometimes the best you can do is capture the spirit of the writing. To veer off sharply into your own original material, but to bring with you a Lovecraftian universal philosophy. Which is a method that has had the best success rate, in my experience. And this is where today's subjects of dissection come in. Two films that feel intrinsically linked by their cosmic horror themes and Lovecraftian vibes, while also not being adaptations of any Lovecraft story in particular. And the fact that both films take place predominantly in one location. So let's kick things off with 2022's cosmic horror comedy, Glorious. Glorious is a movie about a man trapped in a bathroom with an elder god in the stall next to him, and how he's forced to talk to this being via a glory hole. Yeah, it's definitely a movie carving its own path. I don't think Lovecraft ever wrote about this. Uh, what the hell is that? What? Well, I thought you thought your human penis was going to save the universe? A public bathroom is one of the most disgusting, horrifying places to find yourself in. So just imagine being trapped in one indefinitely. That alone is scary enough. Now just throw in a sentient protoplasmic slime ball, and there you have it, that's the movie. Oh, and I was serious when I said that a good portion of both of these movies are filmed in one location. 
Fixed, controlled sets are commonly used among indie filmmakers to keep costs low. I've even used this same method in my own filmmaking to maintain continuity. Some viewers would see this as a disadvantage, that a film set primarily in one location lacks variety and scale in their environments. However, I've never seen it that way. I have always believed that when a good filmmaker finds themselves working under difficult conditions, they'll find creative and out-of-the-box solutions to keep the audience invested. For example, the first Saw film takes place almost entirely in one room, but James Wan and Lee Whannell use this to their advantage by creating an atmosphere of desperation and being trapped. That yes, the characters definitely feel, but more importantly that feeling spreads to the audience as well. And the same can be said for both of the movies on the autopsy table today. Because unfortunately for our main character, Wes, he's trapped in this bathroom with a smooth-talking elder god blessed with the velvet pipes of J.K. Simmons. <laughs> you serious? I mean... J.K. Simmons voicing a tentacled, slimy abomination. It doesn't get much better than that. At least, not until our next movie. But once I found that out, I knew this would go in my collection. However, focusing more on his role, they chose to characterize this demigod in all the best ways. Let's take a closer look at this scene here, where the characters introduce themselves. So, you're holding your tongue. I'm oh, holding my tongue. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Now. Repeat after me. Got another one. Got another one? Slow it down a bit. Got an uh, 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 one. Slower and grip tighter. Got another ah. Uh. Yes, that's it. Got another one. Yes. What? Your, your name is Got another one. Indeed it is. Sorry for the theatrics, I'm a bit of a stickler for proper enunciation. <sighs> this is one of my favorite scenes in the movie, because one of the things I've always admired about Lovecraft's universe is how bizarrely alien it really is. Lovecraft himself often stated that human vocal cords could not adequately pronounce the name of Elder Gods, due to our physiology just being too different. The most common name that everyone knows, Cthulhu, is not actually the proper pronunciation. Even I'm not saying it right. It's simply the closest that we can approximate to it. So in this scene, Gat teaches his name by using words that humans understand, which sound roughly approximate to a vocalization of his name. This is staying true to a Lovecraftian ideal that I've always wanted to see put to the screen. Later in the film, we learn that Gat requires a sacrifice, as Elder Gods do and until Wes provides it, they will remain trapped in the bathroom until the universe crumbles to dust. A pretty great concept for a cosmic horror film that places the most alluring aspects of the genre as the focal point of the story. I do prefer this approach, as opposed to the more common Lovecraftian adaptation that we typically see. A great example of this is when we see Wes try to escape the bathroom, only for the vent to unnaturally loop back around to where he started. One thing that Lovecraft often wrote about was non-Euclidean geometry, and how beings far more advanced than us were not restricted to our physical laws. As you can tell, this scene showcases this to a great effect. However, this movie also continues the trend of Lovecraftian comedies. Strangely, there are a lot of Lovecraft comedies out there, and I'm really not sure why. Most of the people who write in this genre just seem to always inject comedic elements. And while I can understand the allure of dark comedy, most of the time it just comes off cheesy. And while that can work, I'm not necessarily a big fan of it. Don't get me wrong, the comedy works fine here. It's not amazing, but it's enough to get me to chuckle. But to truly balance darkness and comedy in the same breath takes immense skill and precision. And this is something that I think our next dissection works a little better at. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Some of my bigger critiques of the movie have nothing to do with the writing and come down more to the lack of budget. Some of the digital effects come off only partially rendered at times. Like here, with Gat's father. 
which looks so much less detailed than Gat does. It's just a vague arrangement of weird shapes. And yes, I know, Lovecraft has described creatures like that before, but the actual visual result looks unpolished as hell and ruined any threat that this character had. Overall though, I feel like Glorious gets more right than wrong. A character living a normal life who gets their entire world fucking rocked. Check. Cruel, uncaring creatures with abstract designs that seemingly make no sense according to our understanding of physics. Check being small or unimportant in the face of ancient horrors beyond conception. Check. A sense of otherness or not belonging. Yeah, there's a twist with Wes that reveals he is not like the rest of us. So check. Admittedly, there's no forbidden knowledge that tests the limits of a character's sanity. So I didn't hit bingo with this one, but 4 out of 5 ain't bad. Ah! Next up on our list is 2013's indie cult film, Motivational Growth. As longtime fans of the channel can tell you, we're big fans of Jeffrey Combs around here. I've long held the belief that he's one of the most versatile actors working today. Jeffrey Combs brings a uniquely different energy to every part he plays, showcasing an incredible range. The power of the mind is absolute. <laughs> and motivational growth is no exception, showing that he can even play a sentient, malevolent fungus without breaking a sweat. But we'll come back to him. This movie follows Ian a guy struggling with depression and mental health issues that prevent him from functioning in society. For example, he can't bring himself to leave his apartment or take care of himself or his surroundings. And honestly, same. As someone who also struggles with depression and anxiety, I've always found Ian's experience to be very relatable and sympathetic. It's honestly one of the things that drew me to this movie in the first place. But the result of this unhygienic lifestyle can clearly be seen in his bathroom, where a truly gnarly patch of green mold grows in the corner. The only thing Ian can do is watch TV. Until... Fuck! It's at this point that Ian loses touch with reality and decides to... remove himself from life. After a failed attempt, Ian then meets the mold. Jack, do the mold real solid, all right? Grab up all of your jacks and marbles and bouncy balls and listen to me for a second. Can you do that, Jack? My name's Ian. Oh, the mold knows, Jack. The mold knows. <laughs> I absolutely love the mold. It's characterized so incredibly well by Jeffrey Combs and the writing itself. The Mold has this old-timey, sort of antiquated, boomer-esque way of talking that sounds familiar, but also barely makes any sense the more you think about it. The Mold is here to help you, Jack. The Mold wants to get you back onto your feet. The Mold wants to get you rooked right ways, on the stick, locked, loaded, and ready I'm for I'm sorry, action. I have no idea what you're saying. The mold's about two shakes from totally frosted right now. Tell the mold you won't open that door again. What if it's- Say it! It's super unique and gives the mold this sense that it just picked this stuff up over the eons that it's been listening to humans from bathroom walls. And you can sense how it uses that knowledge to manipulate people into doing what it wants. The mold convinces Ian that it wants what's best for him and that it's here to help him out of his depressive state in exchange for some small favors. <laughs> As you can tell, like the last movie, this is some pretty high concept material, especially in its presentation. But honestly, I think some of the best movies are high concept, practical effect indie films. I would consider this to be one in a long line of movies in my collection that dive into the truly strange and otherworldly. I find myself drawn to movies that are bizarre or alluring in ways that I've never seen before and challenge me to look at filmmaking or even just storytelling in a new light. 
For example, in Motivational Growth, there is this really fascinating background character study of The Mold and Kent, Ian's television set. My read of this film is that these two characters are actually fighting for dominant influence on Ian. Look, shit's about to get real weird, so you're just gonna have to keep up here. I'm about to lay out my metatextual analysis of this movie, and it is out there. It's best to look at the Mold and Kent as two Lovecraftian entities vying for maximum influence on Ian. Kent blowing out a fuse is the inciting incident of the movie, and it's because of Kent losing control that Ian's depression starts to spiral. Fast forward a bit, and suddenly the Mold is trying to gain influence now that Kent is out of the picture. Fast forward again, and we learn from a TV repairman that the Mold's been growing inside Kent and is responsible for blowing out the fuse. Your tube's been corroded. Looks like you have a mold problem. <sighs> yes. Yes, it does. It's at this point that we can clearly discern that the mold took out Kent. The mold even possessed someone, uh, somehow, and pretended to be a TV repairman to convince Ian to get rid of Kent. You can't hide it, Ian. It's all, all over you. I can smell it. Oh, I, I haven't bathed in months. You're suffering. I can stop that suffering. I tasted your suffering and I swallowed it! You really should consider getting a plasma. <laughs> And at this point in my original watch through, all I could ask myself was, why? And this is when it hit me. I think the mold's a parasite. Yeah, not in the slither sense, although very possibly. The mold does make Ian eat and drink from it directly. But no, what I mean by parasite is he's using Ian in every aspect of the word, but mostly just to keep the mold alive. This then begs the question, what does the mold live on? The mold may have wanted a blood sacrifice like the elder gods of old, as we see him eat Ian's girlfriend later on. And I do think that the mold is a carnivorous life form. We know that later in the film, as part of the mold's mind-washing propaganda, it forces Ian to cut holes in all the walls of his apartment and pour grow more into them, so that way the mold can grow into every room. This gives it the ability to fire poison darts at anyone who comes into the apartment, thus giving the mold more food. And from what I understand, it takes full control of Ian and uses him to prepare his food before trying, poorly, to wipe Ian's mind of those events. So I feel like I've got the mold pretty figured out. As for Kent, well, they're a bit trickier. When Ian is unconscious, Kent speaks to him through the different characters on the TV shows he used to watch. I know you're listening to me. You need to keep listening to me. It's the only way you're gonna work this out. I've been here for you. I will always be here for you. Kent has a bit more of an authoritative nature, but speaks in vagaries and riddles that have to be picked apart like the word of God. And Kent is kind of an elder god in itself, because it has a deep, almost prophetic knowledge of the mold, which can be seen here. in the summers that follow. Weather's all treacherous. Do you still seek to know? And what? Kent attempts to warn Ian about the mold here, and the imagery makes it very clear that if he continues to listen to it, then he's going through a doorway he can't come back from. 
Kent appears to have only Ian's best interest at heart. And if we take what the bad pad genie said at face value, then the mold is a manipulative creature that feeds on those suffering through mental anguish. But you have to ask yourself, are either of these characters trustworthy? How much can you believe what these characters are saying? They both could be working towards their own individual goals. Still, this tells us nothing about Kent's motivations. Personally, I've always been wary of people who claim to know what's best for me. And Kent never misses an opportunity to tell Ian when he's doing something stupid or should be doing something differently. Now look, you may have them fooled, but you and I both know I'm behind all of this. You do exactly what I say if you want to come out of this anything more than a sweat stain on the workout mat of eternity. Now, on to Tony! If Kent is a malevolent entity, then my best guess is that it may have been draining Ian's youth, literally and metaphorically, and tells Ian this in order to convince him not to trust the mold. Meaning that Kent may want Ian just to sit down and give himself over to it again. But this is just my theory, it's all up for debate. Nothing is certain in this movie. To what ends the mold and Kent are working toward is still unknown to me. But I've always considered that to be part of the Lovecraftian nature of these characters. It's not for a human mind to know or even be able to comprehend their greater plans. In which case, you could also view them as demons of the psyche, manifestations of Ian's inner conflict and trauma. Because, and here's the kicker, what if he didn't survive his suicide attempt at the start of the movie? At several points throughout the film, we see shots of a body decaying on the bathroom floor. My personal take on this is that it's a view either into an alternate reality or the true reality. Either he's seeing into a parallel timeline where he succeeded, or what's worse, we're seeing the truth. That he died on the floor, and the battle between the Mold and Kent was just his last few neurons firing before slipping away. And this movie is simply showing us what that looks like. I honestly think that this will be the biggest hang up for most people. Because most people, when watching a movie, don't tend to like this sort of vagueness, where what you saw was not concretely established as real, and could just as easily have been a three-second hallucination in the head of a dying man. And while I do understand and sympathize with that perspective, I like that this movie is more of an evocative piece, and that you can decide for yourself what you saw. In the end, Ian chooses to make a decision for himself rather than listen to either of these entities, which I feel is the message of the movie. Sometimes it's best to listen to your heart rather than the advice of others, because you can never know what motivates them. Stepping back and just looking at this movie objectively, it's just a really solid indie project. The acting from everyone involved is interesting in one way or another. The puppetry and practical effects for the mold is just awesome. The dialogue is super weird and trippy. And as always, Jeffrey Combs steals the show. And strangely, motivational growth feels like a lighter, fluffier movie compared to Glorious. While both movies do take place in disgusting locations, motivational growth feels like it's having more of a goofy, cheesy romp with its premise because of how outlandish it is. It has more comedy in it, but I have to admit, it's a strange sense of humor. Glorious, on the other hand, was trying to be a bit more serious with occasional comedy. If you ask me, I think both films nailed what they were trying to do respectively, be it a goofy weird comedy or a dark comedy horror. Now I won't lie, I have been desperate for a big budget Lovecraftian film for years. I would be the first person to go see Del Toro's adaptation of At the Mountains of Madness, or James Wan's Call of Cthulhu. But honestly, as I've gotten older and seen what blockbuster movies have become, thanks a lot Marvel, I've actually wanted that less and less. Indie filmmakers do such a better job adapting Lovecraftian stories, and I truly think that it comes down to the fact that they have full creative control. There's no overpaid CEO breathing down their neck insisting that these films are made more palatable to general audiences, or crammed full of shitty CGI like The Thing from 2011 was. Glorious and Motivational Growth were both passion projects at heart. These are one-of-a-kind movies that show how Lovecraftian themes can be explored successfully. 
and I can only hope that future adaptations take inspiration from them. Alright, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, be sure to hit that bell down there. Some of you may have noticed the channel rebrand, which I chose to do for a number of reasons. To my subscribers though, don't worry, I will still be making cinema dissections, and Cypher's still on the way at some point. But in the meantime, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.